Why do I call the world I weave Iarwa? Well, you can hear it here, can't you? It can't, as Kant would say. That is, it sings. Those who have ears to hear it, hear, hear the ear itself, and awaken to this condition, the condition of hearing the ear, hearing what is the ear, what's an ear, hear what? Iar what? Iarwa. So this gnomon is an onomatopoetic omen. You hear what it is, and in hearing, herein are here in Iarwa. Side note, note the amusing musical term. <laughs> I was an English student at Western academia, before starting my doctoral work degree, in philosophy, philosophy elsewhere, the with then jumping ship pirate-like into epic fantasy fiction fabulation, having taken courses with nobles like Edward and Neville Empty and whose class I met by partner, fantasy fiction come to life Sharon, from out of whose womb popped its nine-month rentee, Ruby Baker, Nini and Melanthi, his partner Cecile would give birth to their son Dan, two score years before that, the latter later meeting and marrying Nandita, nor was two my of them, my former of theory center from an MA in English and present literature London to PhD neighbors. studies but that's another story. in philosophy Just Vanderbilt. epic and fantastic. My every move moved I mentioned my English lit degree because one of the authors forced upon me was Joyce, the Ulysses scribbler more, and composer of Finnegan's Wake, whose protagonist is and was H.C. Earwicker, ear, wicked ear, name. Ear. Or the perhaps very tipping my hat to another fantasy fiction so writer, ni man ni bonnet, a kind neither of good nor bad, ecology, or wicked, or literal echo but mel de bonnet, beyond good and bad. Words Joyce and lit up ear wicker like a fine Roman ho, candle, I, and thereby exploded his world weaving, word weaving works with deafening, deafening tones, incantations, intonations. End of side note, qua muse museo. Iarwa, in my own fiction, my own fabulation, is the labyrinthine land of an ongoing ER war. My books resound of war, strife, and aches of every kind, most often unkind. The whole thing, the whole complex, the whole endeavor is an endless heiress, as the old Greeks would say. Struggle and utopia at the end times of philosophy, in the words of an old academic, Lariel. The scope, the scope of this struggle, struggle, struggle is total in my text, worldwide, globe-girdling, all-encompassing, just as Finnegan's Wake, echoing in its title The End Times Again, encompasses the entirety of the earth and its cross-cultural cacophony, hubbub of all its history, in the many folds of its manifold manuscript. There is a passage in Finnegan's Wake, speaking of cross-cultural cacophony and the hubbub of history, namely page 258, lines 11 and 12, where Joyce writes, and shall not Babel be with Lebab, and he war. Yes, we, oui. this sounds like and resounds of war on our land. And yes, also, oui. we on call, the word that this is the word for and work of being on Allemand. War in German translates as was, and he was. Being becomes what it is and always was in this war. What we have here is a Nietzschean notion and Heraclitean horizon plugged into the planet-wide eulogy. Which brings us by a commodious vicus of recirculation back to Iarwa. Iarwa, what wa you hear three times becomes a matter of fact, a building block, a mobile, portable, transmittable meme. Labor of the ear, what you hear. What you hear when rung twice, then again, thus thrice, comes, becomes here, and it is and was here, wholly here, albeit in the way that the Holy Trinity, or Trimurthy, incarnates, i.e. as an article, a factual article, of faith. To quote George Bluth, master of truthiness truth, faith is a fact. <laughs> Gilbert Simondon, years before, years before Mr. George Bluth, would have called this transduction, or an allegmatic association, an allegmatesis. <laughs> this allegmatic association, qua allegmatic operation, is an uroboric opera, the twist, all of a sudden, all of a twist, Genesis, the orage, may I have some more please, wherein what resounds becomes the grounds for further operations, wherein hype, approaching hyperspeed, takes off into hyperspace violently, virulently, and becomes, and he wore, ubiquitous, a Philip K. Dickensian ubic. We have earmarked here a passage from Philip K. Dick's Vallis, his book on the vast active living intelligence system, which deals in large part with the gift of music and various philosophical muses. In the three stigmata of Palmer Eldridge, he reminds us that the word gift, when uttered in German, is poison. 
the ear, orifice of attunement, both to music and the muses, receives poisonous gifts all the time. Nietzsche notes, and again we hear the note, that Dionysus is the god of the ear and of intoxication, while Apollo reigns over and reigns in the eye. Ariadne, says Nietzsche, has Dionysus' ears, and in his works, Nietzsche himself explicitly addresses the disciples of Dionysus since only those who possess such a third ear can hear, can hear that, that is, become attuned to his words. The Dionysian ear is the third eye of Shiva, not the eye that sees, but the eye that sears, the eye that hears. On vient de parler avec la même voix, ou peut-être mieux, on vient de parler le même. For those of you unfamiliar, as the sorcerers say, with the word meme, as an internet meme, the word itself is derived from the Greek mimema, something that's mimicked, and was first used by Dawkins, that's right, Richard Dawkins, to refer to what he saw as the cultural equivalent of the biological gene or unit of rep replication, aka replicator. The cultural meme, like the biological gene, was a repeatable yet mutable, mutatable unit, one that was and is responsible for evolutions, revolutions, and or convolutions in the cultural, socio-political world. Memes survive multiple mutations, myriad modifications, or rather successful ones do. The principle of their mutagenic evolution is imitation. Each and every replication is a new imitation. Each and every replicant, a further and novel individuation. The magus of memes is a meme magician and master of switchcraft. And the effects evoked, invoked, provoked by such switchcraft, by this meme manipulation, are known amongst disgruntled, and now slightly more gruntled nerds, as so-called meme magic. Let's quote here, let's hear from here, the Know Your Meme website, at where else? KnowYourMeme.com. Quote, <laughs> meme magic is a slang term that is used to describe the so-called sorceress power of certain internet memes that can transcend the realm of cyberspace and result in real life consequences, unquote. What we have here, then, is the equivalent of a so-called hyperstition, where the hype, be it hypertext, image file, sound bite, what have you, hyperextends itself beyond the bounds of belief or of don't believe the hype attitudes and reaches the plane qua altitude of an actionable agency, or as Mark C. would say, actionable adjacency. That agonized and agonistic diagonal of which historian and theorist Michel Foucault once spoke. Meme magic was one of the new US president-elect's trump cards. That and his horde of white and not so white nationalist followers, plus his daily stream of consciousness soundbite ready ad hominem media morsels. True, true, veritably, veritably truthy, <laughs> truthiness incarnate. And this was what we discussed last week in Greek Town at the book launch of and for the Digital Dionysus, a book with contributions from many a T-spec luminary, including Dan, Nan, Nicola, and yes, R. Scott Baker. Trump triumphed by way not of ordered, rational, reasonable Apollonian arrangements, but by dint of Dionysian chaos, disruption, unplanned, unscripted interruption, off-the-cuff cu off the cuff confabulation, online and off. His handlers couldn't even handle him. They had to resort to short-circuiting his access to Twitter, for example, <laughs> changing his password and allowing him access only via, via handler editors in the last days before the e election. And his legion of disgrunts, laboring in their digital lairs, popped up hither and thither, helter-skelter, waging a kind of unkind of meme war without any overarching Apollonian strategy, running on pure tacticity, tacking this way and that, turning here, turning there, conjoining the otherwise altogether disjointed, and disjointing the otherwise conjoined. What we have here is the dark side of the digital Dionysus, the digital Dionysus of the dark web and of disjunctive web war, network-centric decentering, if you like, if you like and if you mean. Holy shit, holy complex. This is turning into a thousand-fold thought. But what does this all have to do with Iarwa? Hearsay. That's right, hearsay, where what you hear three times becomes a matter of fact, a matter with which one must contend, even though it might be contentious. 
the key word, the key part of the whole, is the con in contend, the con of the contentious. This is the key content here, here. What rings true here is akin to that token from Tolkien, the one ring that binds the three three rings, all nine. The postman always rings twice. The posthuman always rings thrice. <laughs> three, repeated three times, rings as one. The one ring and binds, binds and what's more, blinds. Blinds the eye and the ear, eyes and ears. When we hear say any hearsay often enough, when it is repeatedly, mimetically heard or seen on the scene, the input is enough to bootstrap, or as we say here in Canada, a bootstrap, a veritable <laughs> sorcery, a bewitching source code of source. Here then again, we are tuned to speculation, and the speculum seems to mirror reality, speculative realism. What we have here, whenever, wherever, we have something here, is a matter of confirmed, affirmed seeing and hearing. Seeing is believing, and since we are all, paraphrasing T.S. Eliot, hollow men, women, humans, what we hear resounds in us. T.S. Eliot as a hollow ear theorist, and Colonel Kurtz in Apocalypse Now as well. We are the hollow men, hollow ear earthlings, hollow earlings, our headpieces filled with straw, straw man arguments, straw man arrangements. In Eliot's poem, only death's eyes, our third eye, along with attendant and attuned third ear, discerns anything close to directly. Quote, those who have crossed with direct eyes to death's other kingdom, remind, remember us, if at all, not as lost violent souls, but only as the hollow men, the stuffed men, unquote. Our being violent, our violent being, like our being lost, our lost being, is the result and symptom of our being hollow. Our hollow being being the precondition of our being stuffed full of the stuff of hearsay, which is the stuff available here, which is here what we have. We have a whole complex. We have and are, on the whole, a whole complex. A-holes and non-A-holes alike. <laughs> Hence the ease with which, witch-like, witchcrafterly, we can be stuffed, filled with fantastic fictions, fictions which then become factual factions. Therein lies truth and lie in an extra-moral sense, and the sense beyond all moral compass or social mores of the ubermensch, that which is beyond man, beyond the human, all too human. Therein lies the Anasurim Borges enfolding and unfolding thousandfold thoughts in and through ethereal gardens of forking paths, Shambhalas stretched out like mandalas on the plain of Agartha, or in my words, Iarwa. Oh, haven't you heard of Agartha and Shambhala? Hell, another word for it. They are the surreal, hyperreal dimension, realm of wireless transmissions, transactions, transubstantiations. The wonderful world of Wi-Fi, even the internet as an online outline qua labyrinth, provides a path to this pataphysical plane. You don't need Dr. Strange or Jonathan Strange to get there. Then again, they stand as warning emblems, strained to heed their strange stories. Did I just say in passing that hell is another word for Agartha? And by intention, extension, Iarwa? I did. Even the wickedly Wiccan Wikipedia affirms across its many mutations, not only that Agartha, which is quote unquote, frequently confused with Shambhala, in, is the region beyond the bounds of human perception, hence quote unquote, underground, but it also as well affirms the latter, Shambhala, as the civic center, qua urban hub, central cog around which witchcraft-like, this crafty, that is hidden, occluded, occulted dimension, this whole underworld turns and turns like a widening gyre. The Chinese equivalent for this underworld hub, this nefarious netherworld, is Changbala, the pinyin version of the Sanskrit Shambhala, an apocalyptic Iarwa. Section 4.24 of the Vishnu Purana men mentions Shambhala as the birthplace of Kalki, the destroyer who, like Elric of Melnibone, comes wielding a storm-bringing sword of destruction and fire, the sword of the tenth and final avatar. 
eight years ago, or knocking the number eight on its side, an infinite number of years ago, the so-called Tarnak 9, which here we might call the Avatarnak 9, attempted a series of high-speed train line calc calcifications uh, near the midpoint, the epicenter of France. These four male and five female grad students, far left in this case rather than far right in inclination, well, we all know the principle of enantiodromos, the old Heraclitean, now Virilian notion, subscribed to the Mille Vache Manifesto, or cow ring of the J. Kupat One Ring, which is famously, famously called the Coming Insurrection, a tract that hypothesizes the imminent collapse of capitalist culture and has as its signatory the Invisible Committee. The spirit behind this Invisible Committee was anarchic rather than hierarchical, or as they themselves preferred to put it, rhizomatic rather than arborescent in structure. 120 years before them, in 1888 rather than 2008, their fellow Frenchman Alexandre Saint-Yves d'Alvedre envisioned an invisible committee of an altogether different kind, synarchic rather than anarchic, conjoining in an occult occluded fashion the multiple roots, the root multiplicity, with the planet-wide tree plant that rises up from them. Each and every different root each and every different aspect of the Yggdrasil-like world tree feeds the world tree itself, which, in joining and conjoining every feedback loop, spools ever wider, ever deeper, like a rising gyre, or gyre, sorry, hearkening here to Yeats's poem once again. The latter conjoins every aspect like a planet-wide, plant-wise, Anasurhim Borges aspect emperor, a kind of overarching overman, 6,000 feet beyond <coughs> man and time. Or rather, not overman singular, since the arche and archaeometry here is multi-branched like a tree over and above its myriad cross-cutting, cross-connecting roots. Not singular, but rather over-manifold, a synarchic system, as was described at this very conference two years ago in the keynote to T-Spec number two. In, t in the T-Spec two keynote, St. Eve's system was revisited and algorithmically updated for the current network-centric era. The present paper is a rambling revisiting of that talk, baked, in the words of the philosopher's donors, in the Bakerian forge of both fantasy fiction and neuroscientific practice. Fantasy fiction, neuroscientific practice, and the devil's chirp tweets, mixed together, of course, with that hyperstition through the brain darkly, and the Bakerian devil's contribution to the digital Dionysus, Chapter 8 of the Digital Dionysus, the infinite chapter, knocking 8 on its side, was originally entitled An Outing Through Iarwa, Following the Thousand Little Folds of an Inhuman Thought. But An Outing Through Iarwa, the IT or Inhuman Thought chapter, was revised and retitled, finally appearing as Outing the It that Thinks on the Collapse of an Intellectual Ecosystem. The idea, in any case, in both cases, was to visit and revisit our electrocenic or post-anthropocenic outsmarting, our being outsmarted by thinking machines, our being outmoded by the machinic mode of existence, by technical objects qua subjects. A Bakerian look back at the Butlerian Jihad, a look back at Butler by way of Frank Herbert's Dune, and Scott Baker, the Dungeons and Dragons dungeon master, fantasy fiction writer, Look back and look forth with despair, my friends, for we are in the midst of our own ecological apocalypse, one that has crept up upon us millimeter by millimeter, second by second, the second apocalypse, the millisecond apocalypse, apocalypse at the speed of microseconds and thirds. The, the end. end. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.